Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between New Art School and Design Didax Podcast. Our guest today is Christina Lamour Sanson. Welcome, Christina. <laughs> Thank you, Lefteris. Nice to meet. Nice to, nice to see you again. It's I fantastic say. to have you here. Fantastic. Yeah. So tell us about you and your work. Of course. Oh, thanks. Yeah, my work. Um, hmm. Well, the work that I really want to focus on today is to talk about um, my work in design instinct learning, which is a which is a platform that I've been developing um, since college, since my college thesis, which looked at uh, uh, the this general question of can graphic design be spontaneous um, and looking at sort of spontaneity and graphic design. Um, this led me to look at children's work, early childhood, and the connections between um, human development and graphic design and growth in our communication wow. um, writing systems. So tell us, tell us more. <laughs> that sounds great. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, when, when I was studying uh, graphic design in college, I went to um, the University of the Arts in uh, Center City, Philadelphia. Um, we learned in a, you know, kind of international style was the, was the pedagogy at the time. So we were, you know, working with placa and, you know, black and white paint and, you know, very structured, very disciplined study, six hour studios, drawing cubes and, you know, very structured. Um, and all along, um, I was questioning in my own study, like, you know, where can we be free? You know, where can, where can designers like not kind of work within that kind of tight structure? Because, um, I, at that time I really didn't want to go into graphic design because I really went into it because I thought it was a career that I could make money in. But, but then I, as I got into the study, uh, especially during sophomore year, when I was painting a letter form, uh, sans serif E we using ruling pens and placa and black and white paint. Um, I sort of, I didn't realize at the time, but really what I was being trained to do was being taught to see. But I, all along, I was just questioning though, like, where's the, where's the individual in this, you know? But I was told it was an international style and that we weren't being taught style. So there was like a lot of contradictions in that, in that education. So um, yeah, and it was in the senior year when I was working with my thesis advisor, Kenneth uh, Hebert, who founded the program, who I've has been the, one of the most major influences in my, my work. Um, you know, uh, I asked him about this question, can graphic design be spontaneous? And he suggested that I go look at children's drawings. And that's kind of where I started to see the links between graphic design as a learning process, like a lifelong learning process and the connections between our, um, like, innate biology. You know, it's human beings. So, so. Tell us more about this. You mean spontaneous as expression or spontaneous as a solution? Um, I think both. I mean, I'm still kind of figuring okay. it out. So it's still, it's still like a mystery, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I would say that most recently, what I've understand this to be is really about a faculty's need in design school, in a structured design classroom, to be prepared to really deeply listen to a student's absolutely tendencies, yeah. their the the cultural kind of you know sure. identities of what they bring to the work, and I don't think that that's always the case. But you, you in graph design classrooms, you're saying these. <laughs> you're saying this after being taught the rules. Yeah. And there are rules. Like I think grids are rules. They're natural, maybe mathematical yeah. rules, but there needs to be a place for, I don't really like to think of it as expression because I think that's a little new agey. Uh -huh. I think it's more about like our own inherent, you know, those things that are built in where they're hardwired. Okay. okay. So this is the latest project you know. you're working on. Are there any other projects? Um, I mean, I've been working on this for a long time. I mean, my, the platform for my thinking is called design instinct learning, and that's like an umbrella for like all the things that I do. Mm -hmm. So I teach, um, I'm a core faculty member. I've been at Lesley university for 20 years. I'm a critic at the Rhode Island school of design and the teacher education program. Um, I also consult and have been consulting for 
school districts, administrators on academic uh, infrastructure for many years. I mean, you know, I do a lot of consulting um, outside of my academic mm -hmm. role. I'm working in, I'm doing a lot of court, court, uh, community organizing right now in Rhode Island to create new schools inspired by communities, working with community organizations um, and healthcare and design and art and different Sounds very exciting. folks in Rhode Island. Yeah. So I, it's kind of like I, I put this umbrella term to it, design instinct mm -hmm. learning to, to capture all the activities under my work. Fantastic. Fantastic. So how did you get into mm -hmm. teaching? Teaching? Well, actually, Kenneth Hebert, who I mentioned, I mean, he really, uh, he was a major influence in my senior year of college in 19, in this, you know, 1990, 1991, um, when we started working on my senior thesis. Um, and I really, I mean, it may sound a little like, you know, sentimental, but it's just like, I wanted to pass on what I got from Ken, because he, he really saw me for who I, who I was as a, as a human being. And it wasn't about this sort of codified rules. It was more about, he was directly listening to my questions and he directed me based on that listening. And I, I feel like that's something that it's that kind of, um, access and equity that he provided as a, as a faculty and an educational leader that I wanted to do. And so tell on. us a bit more about him. What, what were his, uh, principles? Well, you know, um, I, I actually have um, a series of Ken's credos that he mm. wrote over mm. the years. He founded the program in Philadelphia in the, in the mid 60s, I think, 60s. And he's had a series of these credos over the years. Um, and he's written a couple of books where if you want, we could add to the source list, graphic design sources and graphic design processes. And in those books, he outlines his pedagogical framework um, which to be honest with you, I don't quite understand. It's very, it's not that it's theoretical. It's just filled with lots of language that's very coded okay. and it's very, it's difficult for me to understand, but I knew, I guess I understand it more based on how I felt than what I read in the theory. Could you, you know, give it to us in like in a couple of sentences? Um, yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I think that my peer, I could I could I could reflect in the what my peers and I would right. say after we yeah. graduated. So I still I still stay in touch with a yeah. lot of people I went to the design program with and many of my best friends and we've talked about it as like being kind of like Ken taught us kind of a spirit it was like a spiritual quest mm -hmm. on like trying to find you know maybe it's ourselves in graphic design, you know? Maybe, maybe that's how I understand it, but we would, we would often describe it for years as a spiritual quest. Um, I think that that, that understanding now in today's context is perhaps problematic How come? because when we, when we tie, I think, you know, I think it's controversial to tie the spiritual to commercial art. I, I don't know. I don't know. Do you think it's controversial? No, not or? at all. I mean, uh, many, <laughs> many designers have talked about the values behind their work. And that's really, uh, that's uh. the core. For me, that's the core of design. It's the, the values uh. at the core that you're trying to express visually. And, that, and what, yeah. what really shapes, really, because, because the work is shaped by our values, not, not, not by visuals. So really, it's those values yeah, at, at the I core, agree. at the heart of the work that, that, that define how that work mm -hmm. is shaped and how that work is created absolutely is, is more relevant than ever. In fact, it should be more relevant than ever. Oh, and do you think, do you feel it, that's cultivated in design schools, in particular in Europe, where are you, where are you? I know what I'm doing working? and I am cultivating. I, I, I am cultivating <laughs> right. something like that. Uh, yeah. And yeah. It, it can yeah. be. It, it, it's about how you want to talk about it. You did, you know, it's about how you phrase that to the students that, you know, it can be phrased in many levels. It can be phrased with many ways. Uh, but at the, but at yeah. the heart really of, of, of design is yeah. what are the values of the designer that compel them yeah. to create a certain design. Yeah. Well, I guess I think that that was maybe in competition when I was in design school in the late, you know, in the uh -huh. late eighties, 
where the maybe the values of the international style yeah. this and many of yeah. my faculty were trained in yeah. Basel that that maybe that value system played along but maybe sometimes was in conflict with my fact with the faculty okay because many many were brought up in the US but they they studied in Switzerland but so but the values are always know. going to be in conflict and and that brings us to to you know to how we can uh-huh. even more apply this in today's environment how can how yeah. can we bring this the values the the ideology the approach i would say you know you can call it an approach it's a much softer sort of but how can you bring that into today yeah well and i think that if you look on my website i have a section there which is a little maybe for some esoteric but <laughs> but there's a section on like um the relationship between a teacher's values with the school values and identity. Uh So how does, when you are a faculty member or you're a teacher in a school and the school says, well, this is our mission statement. This is our value system. You know, should that align with one's own value system? So for example, if you're working for a social justice institution, you know, it says that on the website, you know, how does that relate to your own values? I, I kind of think that's what it was like for me in college was like, we, there was sort of like, it was clear that as a community of faculty, there was like a set of values, a set of rules. But then like what, what I really appreciated in Kenneth Hebert's work was that he set his own mm-hmm. values and he made them explicit in his writings. So it was public. He was publishing his first book, or maybe it was, his, it was graph design sources when I was in college and he was collecting student work and writing about it. Um, but it was definitely from his voice and all of my peers knew that, oh, that's Ken's thing. <laughs> you know, that's Ken's manifesto. That's his work. However, you know? humanitarian so. values are deeply embedded in art and design. Yeah. And, and yeah. I just don't think they're discussed enough, though, don't you think? Like in schools, I, I don't think it's as transparent for students. I think we school. have to, uh, there are levels. Yeah. There are levels. Okay. So I think that if we cannot sort out challenges on a certain level, okay, then we cannot go to the next level. And unfortunately, I, I mean, I mean, one of the big, biggest challenges of, of, of our design, design education right now is that, especially in, in visual, visual communication graphics, is that students come with less and less uh, knowledge, previous, previous knowledge. They come uh. more and more unprepared. In in your context, in 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 higher education, they they haven't done mm. the previous. They haven't done a, th- a thorough foundation. They haven't had uh, prior. Oh, see, it's different in my context because at Leslie, we have a lot of students come to the program already with an associate's degree. Okay. So they already have ah. that. They have some foundational but, but, kind yeah, of but history. But how, how is that? How is that translated to, to, to real skills? Um. Actually, many of our students come to the program with a, a lot of Brilliant. skills, like craft Brilliant. skills, technical Brilliant. skills. Yeah, Brilliant. they come they come to school Brilliant. with that. So yeah, mm-hmm. if 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 there is if That's... there is there is there is there is a foundation there, then we can yeah. you know we can talk about uh, the next step. But there's got to be somewhere to to build. But what are, what are the values that that bedrock is built on? You know, I would question. You know, I think that's where my I, my work comes in because I believe that we even have to, as faculty, we need to listen more deeply, even be below that mm-hmm. surface of the bedrock. We need to like listen to our students' stories. Absolutely. They're, they're, you know, we have, we need to listen if, if students are newly arrived to the U S like what, 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 what came before, what are their what do they find beautiful? What do they find useful? Absolutely. Um, and I just, I've always had a problem with, this is, this has just been ingrained in me from a young age. Like I'm, I have a big problem with the blank slate mentality mm-hmm. of like, you come to freshman year or foundations as if you didn't have a life before and that not. you're being primed, you're being primed by the faculty. Like we're going to give you the of book like on I mean, how to do this. The great. And I just see that happening still a lot today. I honestly okay. do. I mean, the and, greatest and, diversity yeah. you have in a class, the better yeah. the class. Yeah. You don't, teaching a homogenous class is more yeah. challenging yeah. than teaching a diverse class. Yeah, or 
you know, if you don't, then you need to like, we're doing, you know, or at least I'm, I'm, I'm really being trying to be as countable, accountable as I can to decolonize my curriculum, you know, in the U S because a lot of the canon that was taught to us was, uh, was very incomplete. And, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a, there's an amazing chart that, um, I can include in my source list was an article written by Cheryl D. Miller, um, for print magazine last, um, last summer. And it was, uh, she had, um, commissioned, a uh, a designer from uh, Portland AIGA to design a data graphic outlining the representation in Meg's history of graphic design. And the representation is just, when you see it in data visualization form, it's astounding. Just the representation in the book mm-hmm. is, you know, it's just, it just shows the predominantly, you know, white culture basically in, in the canon and that we just really as educators need to diversify that, um, the representation. So I think it just, it kind of comes both ways. I think when we talk about diversity, design diversity, it's just, uh, I believe it's possible that we can both bring a consciousness to, you know, representation that has been missed and or erased completely in, and we can in reality art and design is, is crossing all boundaries if you, i i think you know, so, so it's not... i think so yeah i guess i would say though is i think that as educators i mean i'm a bit of a i, I like to consider myself a bit like ex, like a, assertive uh-huh. in cer- uh-huh. in terms of like being really really explicit about these ideas and being really explicit to my students and to my community that I'm not going to put up with unacceptable, you know, like lack of representation, you know, or, or just like when, now that I have a consciousness of like something, I have to just express it in my pedagogy, even if it works counter to you know, the school culture at large. And that's, that's, you know, that's been difficult. Do you find that there's challenges in that? Um, yes, I think, I think there's definitely, I mean, this gets to my work too. It's, I think there's definitely, um, there is definitely a problem in the North American elite design school. I think it's structural. I think we have to dismantle a lot of the structures to get at more, a new, a new composition of leadership, a new composition so, of so tell us about like this. student enrollment. Is it, I mean, oh, if, okay. If were, <laughs> this is my, had, this is a bit, if you, had you no know, limitations, if you had the magic wand and there were no limitations whatsoever, financial, managerial, what, what would you do? Well, that's why I was curious about what you're doing um, with this, because, you know, you're creating a new art school. So I was like, you know, we had a pre-talk because I was curious to know like what new learning architectures you're up to here <laughs> with this, this arena. Um, but I really, for me, my lane is really about North American design Mm -hmm. education. And I think if I had like, you know, I could do whatever I wanted, I would, um, I would both evaluate existing structures in the ACAD schools in the U S and I would also, I would look at accreditation. I would look at NASA accreditation um, and I would also look to build new structures. And you're seeing that happen in the U.S. a lot now. There's a, there are new there are new art and design yeah. school structures yeah. that are essentially being built because I think the students have had enough. Like <laughs> there's a lot of protests going on in you know in on social media with just like students are you know are calling it out yeah. and. Um, I think that student. I think the schools need to listen, but I but I do think it's structural. So I was an academic. I worked in academic affairs. I was associate dean for a few years in in my college, and so I was able to see behind the curtain like all the structures of like how an art and design school is built within a larger university because we're part of a larger. So it was like it's kind of like all of the um, you, the plumbing, do, the plumbing. Do you think the right <laughs> you know? people are ending up applying and? Do you think that the process from like school to getting a, a, a place at your university, that that that, that process is is I, is uh, I think there's a lot. 
I think, I th again, I think it needs to be evaluated. I think admissions need to be evaluated. I think hiring processes need to be evaluated. Um, I think that we need, I think we need much better hiring processes. Mm -hmm. I think we need explicit, especially in the art and design school, if we want better representation um, across all mm -hmm. diversity and positionality. I mean, I think that it, it all has to be, re I mean, redesigned, yeah. Yeah. but that's a huge task. Yeah. I think, you know, to redesign all of the art and design schools yeah. in the U.S., like that, that that would take, but I think that's where like an organization like ACAD can, do one school. can really can make do a difference. One school. Yeah, well, that's why I'm building community exactly. schools in Rhode Island because because I do I do think those are I'm on a I'm on a campaign with my colleague um, Zawadi Hawkins who has been an educational leader in Rhode Island for many years, very respected leader, and she and I are leading um, this work and uh, yeah, I think. Uh, we're, we're listening to the community. We're listening to mental health providers. We're listening to students, uh, youth voice, 14 ages, 14 to 24. We're listening to artists and designers. I mean, it's amazing in a small, the small state like Rhode Island, the unbelievable gritty, awesome, like we're talking to uh, like, um, Jacques Biden, who's doing this unbelievable letterpress work in like in Providence. Um, working kind of in the margins, like working in warehouses, working with youth on, on building language and letterpress. And uh, Roberto Gonzalez is doing a program called Steambox, which is like this unbelievable like steam STEM program that he's been doing in like, you know, high school, like attics and basements, <laughs> and, you know, and the, and the students are like so hungry for yes. that kind of like activity, but it's not part of the public schools. Um, you know, I have a son who's going to high school next year and, you know, I just, I've seen what's happened with this remote learning yeah. and I just, you know, it's, it's kind of like where, again, I think it goes back to my premise of like design instinct learning is we have to listen. Fantastic. I think we have to, I think as adults, we have to sit back and listen to what the students are saying. I really do. I think that they're, they're, this generation, especially is just so wise. Like my son is way much wiser than I, you know, he's going to be 14 He's much wiser than me. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's, yeah, I have a lot to say about brilliant. that topic. That's brilliant. a very passionate, I'm very brilliant. passionate as you brilliant. can see about <laughs> so. How can our viewers and yeah. listeners find you? Uh, well, the best place to find me is LinkedIn. Um, and I'm very vocal on LinkedIn. Also design um, is where, uh, my, I, I try to park my work. I, I try to treat that as like a resource mm -hmm. site. So I put, you know, Instagram, I'm, I'm really a big, I take pictures every day Fantastic. of stuff and, Fantastic. you know, you can see my vision Fantastic. through my Instagram, Fantastic. I think. So uh, what is the yeah. last piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? Well, uh, just listen to, st I think faculty teachers need, adults need to listen to students. I think students of all ages, and I think, you know, we, we have to listen to what they want. And we also have to listen to their stories of what came before. Not, it's not only about when they enter your classroom. We've got to listen to it all. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank yeah. you so much for this oh, fantastic great. talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. <laughs>